Hi, I'm Joel Rosenberg, editor and founder in chief of All Israel News and our sister site, All Arab News. And I'm very honored to be joined today uh, from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the executive director there, uh, Rob Satloff. Rob is one of the leading Middle East experts uh, in the United States and has uh, been very, very helpful to me as I've tried to navigate and understand um, the uh, the wide range of nuances and uh, and chasms, I guess, also not just nuances <laughs> uh, in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, Rob, thank you so much for uh, this interview today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Joel. I appreciate it. Listen, we could talk about a lot of things, but I think we should talk about uh, President Biden, Saudi Arabia. Uh, that'll touch a little bit on Iran as well. But I think one of the most interesting developments in the Biden administration is their general sense that they wish they could deal with almost everything else except the Middle East. Uh, a more sympathetic person I could not be, <laughs> but uh, uh, Iran is forcing themselves on the agenda. And, um, and, the, and the president uh, during his campaign uh, called Saudi Arabia uh, a pariah state and said that he was going to reassess the entire relationship. So, and then, and then there's been some dramatic news in the last few days. Would you take a moment and just walk us through the major developments and then we'll sort of unpack each one and, and get your take on the significance of these. Yes, the, the issue of Saudi Arabia, of course, has been a major issue in American foreign policy for years. Uh, um, uh, I don't think your viewers need to be reminded of um, what happened on September 11th when 15 of 19 hijackers turned out to be uh, Saudis. Um, uh, but that was just one episode in a, in a long relationship which goes back to FDR. Um, uh, uh, even before the founding of the state of Israel. Um, uh, now, Saudi Arabia in recent years has been the target of bipartisan concern. It's really the one of the very few issues in American foreign policy in which Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill um, have come have reached agreement. It was the only issue, for example, um, that led to a congressional override in the Obama administration um, uh, when Congress... Um, uh, imposed on President Obama what was known as JASTA, um, a law that permitted um, litigation here in the United States um, for uh, um, uh, 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 to, to target uh, possible Saudi complicity in uh, September 11th attacks. Right. Um, and then came uh, uh, the, uh, the Trump administration, which embraced Saudi Arabia from day one as an important strategic partner but President Trump gave his own unique um, uh, gloss to it, which was they're really important because we can sell them a lot of weapons and they pay cash, which rubbed people, uh, many people, again, on both sides of the aisle, rubbed people the wrong way because it seemed so dismissive of important other aspects of the relationship, uh, including human rights aspects of the relationship. Um, uh, and then there were a series of events um, uh, 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 both internal and in Saudi foreign policy, which grabbed people's attention because they seemed so out of the norm. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia normally, historically, has a very uh, uh, quiet, um, uh, a very subdued foreign policy, seeking consensus uh, within uh, the Arab world and the Muslim world, um, uh, deferential to the United States because we provide so much of Saudi, of Saudi Arabia's security blanket. Um, and yet, over the last uh, two, three years, coinciding with the, uh, the elevation of Mohammed bin Salman uh, to be crown prince, um, Saudi Arabia took a much more assertive foreign policy vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, -vis the war in Yemen, vis-a-vis -vis the rift among Gulf states, especially against Qatar, um, uh, active um, elsewhere in the region, and then, of course, domestically, um, with some, uh, well, on the one hand, um, a very positive changes having to do with um, social and economic reforms um, unheard of in the history of the kingdom, right. and then negatively in terms of uh, crackdown on dissidents, arresting uh, um, uh, women activists, um, uh, freedom of speech activists, and most notoriously the killing of. Um, 
uh, a Saudi journalist resident of the United States, Jamal Khashoggi. Um, uh, this, this confluence attracted the attention of left and right, Republicans and Democrats. And um, uh, um, uh, Joe Biden, um, um, uh, um, uh, you know, made this into more of an election issue precisely because Donald Trump had made it into his own personal issue by embracing the the uh, Saudi leadership so strongly. And uh, uh, candidate Biden made certain commitments about recalibrating the relationship and seeking accountability, quote unquote, for the Khashoggi murder. And there was a law passed, in fact, under the Trump administration, uh, where Congress imposed on President Trump um, the requirement of uh, uh, that the um, the director of national intelligence would release the uh, declassified version of an intelligence report um, on um, high level Saudi complicity in the Khashoggi uh, murder. And that is what happened last Friday, right. where the new director of intelligence, Avril Haines, fulfilled her legal responsibility under legislation to release a, a declassified version of that report. Now let's take um, let's just stop there for a moment. So, uh, so viewers readers can 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 process that you you've just described um, a very complicated relationship, uh, but certainly one that uh, a couple other notes perhaps that um, as the United States and Israel try to figure out how to um, at least contain <laughs> um, Iranian aggression, if not thwart or neutralize somehow. Um, Iran, Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions and other uh, regional um, subversion uh, strategies. Saudi Arabia is a major player in that, right? And so, um, so we've got a, a seventy-five or so year uh, alliance that has actually become, in some ways, more positive over the years. Um, and yet, as you say, um, highly complicated. From 9/11, but also um, during the time of, of Mohammed bin Salman, and I want to talk about him in a moment. Specifically, we're going to need to, but let's go to the report now. The report itself, um, it's interesting uh, because as I read the four-page document, I did not see new details, new evidence. Certainly, don't see a smoking gun, but there's a bombshell uh, assertion that U.S. intelligence has assessed that uh, Mohammed bin Salman was uh, either, uh, that he basically personally ordered um, at least the capture and probably the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, that's quite an assertion to make against an ally, um, except that, so help me unpack that document because in the absence of what I expected, I honestly, I expected there to be proof. And I'm not saying there's not an analytical assessment. There clearly is, but it's a pretty strong decision to put out a, an assertion like that when I, I think most of us were expecting what don't we know yet? We already, we already have the allegations that he did it, but I, I don't see, I see language like probably, we don't know, likely, that didn't seem so definitive. So let's start there. Yes. For, uh, first of all, I should say, Joel, your contextual remark is absolutely right, which is um, uh, what is generally missing from this conversation here in Washington is um, the uh, the overall role that Saudi Arabia plays um, in uh, the uh, the strategic interest the United States has to prevent Iranian nuclear proliferation and to prevent more broadly the spread of Iranian influence. Um, uh, throughout the Middle East, and so we uh, hopefully we can we can get to the the big picture. Right, right. Um, uh, I think your comment about the the intelligence report is 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 on the mark. Um, essentially, when one uh, whittles down this four page report, um, uh, it is an affirmation that this, the intelligence community concludes that uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia was responsible because he had to be, have been responsible. He had to have known what was going on, right. that no one could have made a decision without his approval, without his foreknowledge, without his thumbs up. There isn't, as you say, a, um, uh, a report of a telephonic recording 
of uh, of him giving an order. Um, uh, no one is saying that um, that he um, uh, gave a command, a uh, specific command to uh, arrest, capture, kill uh, Khashoggi. Um, uh, it doesn't exist in the report. Uh, basically, he is responsible because it is um, assessed that the, these events could not have possibly occurred without his approval and his command. Um, uh, in the court of public opinion, uh, uh, there is no doubt that he is now uh, viewed as culpable. Um, in the court of law, I, I, I assume that he would have a, a pretty um, um, uh, strong case to make. Um, but we're not we're not talking about law. We're right. talking about the court of uh, of intelligence assessment and the court of public opinion. And so, what was key about this report is not the is not the the absence or presence of facts. What's key about this report is that now it lifts any remaining veil on the view of the intelligence community as to his culpability. That's all this report does. It doesn't okay, add to I, I our knowledge. I want to press on that. I want to press on that though, just for a moment because, look, the, the assessment may be dead on, and dead on would be the long term. It would be might be exactly 100% accurate. Um, I've been sort of waiting because, as you know, one of the one of the early conversations. Well, you and I first got to know each other was trying to get to know King Abdullah of Jordan. But as I got an invitation to meet other leaders in the region, you've been enormously helpful, and because you met most of them or all of them including uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. So having met with him twice, spent many hours, and trying to process, A, did I do the right thing to meet with him? What did he tell me about this and other things? How do I assess him? Do we support the general direction he's going? But if he's, a, if, this is, if he's the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, then, the, you know, as a person, much less as an evangelical, it's very difficult to to bear. But there was a point that was made in, in the, uh, the report that, that confused me. And, and it listed uh, really 21 specific names of people that the assessment, uh, the intelligence community assesses it was, were, were complicit, okay? A number of them were tried, not all of them were convicted, but it's, it's that list of 18 plus, you know, a few others. But it, this, the report specifically says we do not know if, if these 21 knew that their actions would result in Khashoggi's death. That's, that's the quote. That is very difficult for me to process because if you're accusing the leader of telling them to do it, that's different. If, if it's a rendition went bad, that's, a di that's, that's bad, but that's a different issue than assessing that he that he that he ordered a kill that that, you're, that the intelligence community is also saying, but we don't know if they knew it would result in his death. Well, we would have to have had if that was the order. So I, I am trying to understand what the report means, and then and then the larger picture of Biden's approach going forward. Well, I think you you raise some you know very important uh, questions uh, about the details in the report. Um, as I say, the 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 significance of the report really is not in any particular detail in it because it, sure. it is not a detailed report. It is not a, um, a a grand jury summary that would lead to the um, uh, uh, to the indictment, uh, the legal indictment of MBS. Um, it is. A, uh, a statement of uh, analytical assessment, um, uh, um, uh, a deduction, if you will, right. um, um, based on the most likely circumstance. Um, uh, uh, and I think it's, you know, in my, my view, I, I live more in the, in the world of, you know, policy decisions and policy assessments. It's perfectly reasonable for me to take as a premise that, uh, that the Crown Prince was responsible for the Danish Act. One way or another, and, and that, and, and you factor that into the overall um, uh, uh, decision one has to make about how one approaches relations with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and um, our, our our overall array of interests um, uh, that we have with the kingdom, 
um, uh, uh, where they play a positive role and where they play a, uh, um, a negative role and, and how one engages with the kingdom. I think, I think we get, in my view, as heinous as this was, I think we get a little hung up on um, any one particular action uh, without uh, the overall assessment of, um, uh, uh, of, of, of where uh, Saudi Arabia um, uh, plays in overall American interests um, in the region. And that's okay. where I think the Biden administration is now trying to balance appropriately. Yeah, um, well, some, some are accusing it of being um, uh, 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 actually um, uh, too close doing enough. to yeah. parties. As, as, as you know, not being critical enough. Right. The Washington the, Post, the, the, the Washington publisher Post. is saying is effectively it's a betrayal that, that, that it's a it's a it's a it's a get out of murder free pass is what exactly. uh, Fred Ryan uh, said. You know, but, but let me just say one, one quick yeah. thing. Um, again, I I'm not in a position to, you know, throw out the U.S. intelligence community's assessment. I, I'm taking it very seriously. But I am trying to weigh it as um, the difference between being sure of something and indicting. I mean, essentially, essentially, in the public court of public opinion, you're indicting someone for murder. And what? And when I look at, and I, I'm, I don't mean to get off on a tangent, but I'm actually trying to say, okay, we were sure, the U.S. intelligence community, at least, or at least the Bush administration was sure that the intelligence was telling them that that. Uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Why? Because he had them before, he used them, he acted like he had them, and he seemed to be hiding them. And it, what was not carefully weighed, and we all look at it back and, you know, in retrospect, we said, well, the other answer was he was hiding because he didn't want people to know he didn't have them. Uh, an analytical assumption that we're sure it is because it has to have been it's risky. Uh, the Democrats would have to say, or I'm not sure if they would say, we were absolutely certain that Trump was absolutely, you know, guilty of colluding with the Russians because he had to have been. How else could he have won? And you know, we we have this circumstantial evidence. Turns out it wasn't actually true. So this is one of the challenges. And when you're dealing with an ally, I don't see. I'm just trying to understand it. I am actually not trying to defend. Or, or I'm just trying to understand how you make a decision and how, and, and this goes to the specific question of Biden. He's not getting benefit right now from the left for, for making the statement, right? He's because he's, he's making, he's like, yes, but we can't just throw out the relationship, which I agree with, but you know, that's a very complicated situation to make a, such a blanket accusation. And then he doesn't actually have any consequences directly for MBS, but he won't talk to them. How do we weigh that? So on this issue, I actually give President Biden uh, considerable credit. Um, uh, okay. uh, uh, I think that, um, uh, look, we did go through a period in the previous administration where, um, uh, to a certain extent, intelligence assessments were, um, uh, were politicized, um, which is obviously not unique to that administration, but it was also in that administration. And one of the one of the objectives I think uh, Biden has is to depoliticize intelligence assessments. And and he just re re they released what they had. This is what the assessment is. We can argue over, you know, uh, 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 this or that aspect of it, but it is what it is. And so he um, uh, is under considerable pressure to react. I think he reacted appropriately. Um, uh, uh, um, and um, I think for him to withstand the criticism of um, a significant uh, portion of of his party, not just of his party, but especially of his party, as well as um, outraged voices in the human rights uh, community, um, uh, um, uh, and to maintain a focus on um, uh, some of the fundamental elements of this relationship. I think, in my view, it's the right position to take, and it's not the politically popular position to take. Sure, sure. Um, so I give him credit okay. for yeah, where yeah. he is on this on this issue, Fair and I hope that he. I hope that he sustains this position, um, recognizing all the faults that exist in uh, in Saudi Arabia, but also recognizing the um, uh, the role that Saudi Arabia um, uh, plays in American foreign policy and the uh, the hopeful transformation that is going on inside the kingdom on um, social and economic uh, um, uh, matters, which right. is very important in the long term interest of the United States as well.
So, so, so being uh, grateful for your time, let's, why don't, would you summarize your, your, your core point? You released a paper uh, from the Institute that you, that you run with former Ambassador Dennis Ross. Uh, both of you have spent time with MBS and many Sa Saudi leaders. You you've talked about these things and your recommendations to the Biden administration, which the report came your your paper came out before this was released. But what's the essence of what you're recommending, you and Dennis, um, on how they should navigate this very, very complicated issue? So our basic point is we should remember that we have a stake in uh, uh, in the U.S.-Saudi relationship, that, that Saudi Arabia plays a vital role, uh, an essential role. Um, uh, in fact, there is almost no major American interest in the Middle East that can be achieved without the cooperation um, and partnership of Saudi Arabia. And we have a stake in the domestic transformation that is underway within the kingdom, um, which for all the bumps in the road, is moving in the right direction. And so therefore, we need to sit down quietly with the Saudi leadership and define the next phase in our relationship in which we have a real partnership. We can talk candidly and openly, recognizing all the warts and all the flaws, but within a context of partnership. Um, uh, it's not easy to do. But we should remember that Saudi Arabia is a flawed partner and not a determined adversary. And yeah. we shouldn't treat a flawed partner like you treat a determined adversary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and if we keep that basic point in mind, I think we can build a cooperative relationship that serves our national interest. Do you, are you seeing that same sense ability inside Congress. You have my, my friend, uh, Lindsey Graham, our mutual friend, who would be like, look, as long as MBS is around, I can't deal with the Saudis. Like, that's quite a strong, and that, that that's a visceral feeling, but what, you know, to just to wrap up, what's your, uh, we'll link to your paper as well. There are, there are some very loud voices in Congress. Uh, you, you pointed to one Republican, there are Republicans and Democrats sure. who want us to just cut them off at the knees. Who would uh, who would impose um, such powerful sanctions against the leadership of Saudi Arabia that they could not but um, uh, run away from their part their strategic partnership with us, um, and that I think would uh, you know to mix another metaphor would be to cut off our nose to spite our face, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we urge something which is difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's not popular, but it is in our strategic interest, which is to try to reach a strategic understanding with the leadership of Saudi Arabia about how to go forward. Well, I thought it was an excellent paper, and I and I I, I did agree with it, and I w I would have had you on probably to talk about it even if I didn't, but I but I think it is navigating uh, some very very challenging things, and I think that what we haven't talked about here, but we've also run out of time, is there is a real possibility that Saudi Arabia can get to become a stable and moderate country that is it can be a trusted ally, much more trusted than it would be in Washington today, but also that could be a peace partner with Israel. I think that's real. And I think that uh, the Biden administration has an opportunity. But I am concerned, um, and I'm not a policymaker, but I am concerned that when you accuse a leader and the potentially the future crown prince, I mean, I mean, the future king, when you accuse them of murder, it's going to be tough to, uh, you, I mean, nobody has actually quite said that at, from a president. The president of the United States has essentially accused the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia as a murderer. And uh, that's, that's going to be, that, that could be a train wreck for the relationship as well. But um, let's pray that it is not. Well, let, let, let's hope we can get through these very difficult moments and, and uh, affirm the fundamentals that we do share. Yeah. Rob, thank you. Rob Satloff is the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, the foremost uh, Middle East think tank uh, in the United States. And Rob, I'm very, very grateful for your time and your insights. Thank you for being part of All Israel News uh, interview today. Joel, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. And thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you.